This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. In these podcasts, we uncover one chapter after another from the life of the Prophet wasallam, in an attempt to learn about him, love him, and better ourselves through his example. Immersion, mentorship, companionship, and tarbiyah. These are just a few of the things we offer alongside knowledge of the prophetic biography at the Sira Intensive. Two weeks dedicated to the study of the life of the Prophet ﷺ and his noble characteristics. So this winter, inshallah, join me in Dallas, Texas alongside your classmates from all over the world to learn the story of the life of the best of humanity, the mercy to mankind, the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. Go to sirahintensive.com to register or for more info. Bismillahi wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Inshallah, continuing with our study of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as sirah nabawiyah the prophetic biography. Previously, we discussed in the beginning of the eighth year of hijrah, the battle of Muta, Ghazwa Muta. And we had talked about it in a lot of detail, uh, exactly why it occurred, what transpired, what the reaction of the Prophet ﷺ was to this particular battle and incident, and then the events as they unfolded there. And we also talked about the aftermath of the battle, and how the Prophet ﷺ dealt with the very tragic and unfortunate circumstances of the loss of many key members of his community and many uh, companions of the Prophet ﷺ that were both related and also very, very close to the Prophet ﷺ. What we're going to be talking about today, and now, what we're going to be talking about today uh, is the Prophet some sending letters, sending messages, sending messengers with letters to the, the, to the different kings and rulers of different areas, regions, even empires. And the first thing that I want to mention here before we get started, because to some who maybe have read uh, you know, different books of the seerah, or have you know, listened to different durus on the seerah, the chronological placement of the sending of letters after the battle of Mu'ta, um, and after we've already started talking about the eighth year of Hijrah, might seem a little curious. So the scholars of the seerah have differed as to when did the Prophet ﷺ actually send these letters out. So there are many of the scholars such as Al-Waqidi who is of the opinion that these letters were sent uh, towards the end of the sixth year of Hijrah after they came back from the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Some of the scholars are of the opinion that the Prophet ﷺ sent these letters out at some time or some point in the seventh year of Hijrah. And then yet some are of the opinion that he sent them in the beginning of the eighth year of Hijrah. Ibn Kathir rahimullah ta'ala, he comments after bringing all these different opinions together from Al-Bayhaqi, Bukhari, um, from Al-Waqidi and many many others, he basically concludes by saying that, وَلَا خِلَافَ بَيْنَهُمْ أَنَّ بَدْءَ ذَلِكَ كَانَ قَبْلَ فَتْحِ مَكَّةَ وَبَعْدَ الْحُدَيْبِيَّةِ That he says there's no difference of opinion, and he also says that it's also... Um, the, the fact of the matter is that these letters were maybe, it's not like all the messenger was, messengers were sent out all at one time. It's not like they were all you know, sent out, they went all riding out in different directions at, on the same day. There is, it is very likely that there was kind of a time frame in which one after another the Prophet ﷺ was sending these messengers out, maybe with the gaps of a few weeks or even a couple of months at a time. So that creates more of a scope and a spectrum, a duration of time over which the letters were sent. That's the first thing. Second thing he says that no, the one agreement amongst all the historians and all the scholars of the seerah is that the letters were all sent after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, but prior to the conquest, the Fath of Mecca. They were sent during that time period, which was just about almost two years. That they were sent during that time duration, from the end of the sixth year, all the way till towards the end of the eighth year. That they were sent in between there. 
And the reason for this, Ibn Kathir rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, the evidence for this fact is that as we're going to talk about, it's a very long extended narration and we're going to talk about it from the narration of Bukhari. But in the narration of Bukhari, when Hiraqal, the, the emperor of Rome, when he, Heracles, when he receives the letter from the Prophet ﷺ, and he inquires as to if he can, if they can find anyone who is from that region and knows the Prophet ﷺ personally, if they can find someone and they are able to find Abu Sufyan, who is there on a trading, on a business caravan. And when Abu Sufyan goes and dialogues with Hiraqal, he basically says during the course of their conversation, specifically, he says, نَحْنُ مِنْهُ فِي مُدَّةٍ لَا نَدْرِي مَا هُوَ صَانِعٌ فِيهَا That we currently are in a time of peace, and a time of truce with Muhammad wasallam, And we don't know how it's going to end. We don't know what he's going to do with this peace and this truce that we have agreed to. But nevertheless, we are currently in a time and in a, a place of peace and truce with the Muslims. So that is evidence of the fact that it was after Hudaybiyah, but before the conquest of Mecca. So it's somewhere in between there. Nevertheless, um, Imam Muslim rahimullah ta'ala in his sahih, he has a narration from Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kataba qabla mu'ta ila kisra wa qaysar wa ila najashi. Wa ila kulli jabbarin yadu'uhum ila Allah azza wa jal, wa laysa bin najashi alladhi salla alayhi. He, uh, Anas bin Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu actually says that it was before the battle of Mu'ta, the battle that we had discussed in the previous session. And he says the Prophet ﷺ sent a letter. He wrote a letter to Kisra, who was the emperor of Persia, Qaisar, who was the emperor of Rome, and to An Najashi, who was the king of Abyssinia, East Africa, and to many other tyrants and rulers of different regions and lands. And he was calling them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these letters. And he goes on to comment, just in case this seems a little curious to someone, why would the Prophet ﷺ, particularly somebody again, who's been following with the seerah, they would find it curious as to why the Prophet ﷺ would send a letter to an najashi the king of Abyssinia, inviting him to Islam. Because we know Najashi had accepted Islam. Yes, he had kept his Islam mostly hidden from his own people, but he had communicated. He had corresponded with the Prophet ﷺ. Ja'far bin Abi Talib ta'ala anhu had become a close confidant of his. And the Prophet ﷺ affirmed the iman of al-Najashi on multiple occasions. So why would the Prophet ﷺ send him a letter inviting him to Islam? That Najashi and Najashi, just like Kisra and Qaisar, that was more of a title and not the name. The name of the king of Abyssinia who had accepted Islam and become Muslim was Ashama, as we've talked about previously, and he passed away. So the king that came into his place that succeeded him to the throne of Abyssinia, that king was not Muslim. And the Prophet ﷺ sent that king a letter inviting him to Islam. But this is not, in no way is this contradictory to the fact that an najashi the previous king, had in fact ashama, he had in fact accepted Islam, and died as a Muslim, as the Prophet ﷺ affirmed. And the Prophet ﷺ from a distance, bil ghaib, the Prophet ﷺ from a distance prayed his Salatul Janazah for him in the city of Medina at the passing of An-Najashi. So that should not confuse anyone. Now, two of the incidents that are mentioned with the greatest amount of detail are the Prophet ﷺ sending the letter to the Emperor of Rome, and similarly, the Prophet ﷺ sending a letter to the Emperor of Persia. These are two incidents that there's a little bit more detail about. And that's inshallah what we'll be primarily talking about today. As for the story about the Emperor of Rome, then that story is detailed, prob- is narrated probably in the greatest amount of detail in the Sahih of Imam Bukhari. Imam Bukhari by and far, there are other narrations from Bayhaqi, Waqidi and many others. But the most detailed narration is found in the Sahih of Imam Bukhari. And in that narration, Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, he says, Abu Sufyan told me this story himself. So I got this from the mouth of Abu Sufyan himself. And <clears throat> he goes on to say that, Hiraqal arsala ilayhi fi min Quraysh. That Hiraqal basically sent for 
um, you know, finding if there were any people from Quraysh in the lands. There's another narration of al waqidi that talks about the fact that Hiraqal, the reason why he was in the Bilad al-Sham, the Levant region and area, Palestine, Syria, this region, the reason why he was in this particular re- region to begin with was because he, the Roman Empire had recently achieved conquests. They had been able to conquer a region in this area. They were able to conquest a certain territory in this region. And as a tribute to basically thank, you know, God for this victory that they had been able to achieve, he said that I will go and offer prayers there at the, at Jerusalem. I will go and offer prayers there. And he had basically come there to that region for this particular purpose. And he was in this region, in this area, when he sends out some uh, messengers and he sends out some, uh, some, some representatives, send some people out, that see if you can find anybody from Quraysh. All right? And so Abu Sufyan says that they, they, they found out about us. And Abu Sufyan himself tells the backstory. He says that the reason why we were there on trade and on business for a very extended period of time was that the continuous war that we had been on with the Muslims, the war that we had been engaged in with the Muslims, there was Badr, then there was Uhud, and then particularly Khandaq where the Quraysh suffered a great loss, a great financial loss. He said it had financially crippled us. And yes, we were able to secure the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, kind of make a last show of strength, and be able to secure the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, but we were very worried about our financial capacity, and to be able to fund another battle or another war, if it came to that. So he said that many of the leaders of Quraysh had gathered everything that we could together, gathered all the investments that we could, and we had come out to Bilad sham to basically conduct a lot of trade and business, to be able to generate some profits, and replenish a lot of our funds. So that's why we were out in that region. That's why Qaisar Hiraqal, he was also out in that region as well. So he sends for us and basically says that, find somebody from Quraysh. And he says, they found us, they found out about us, and we went to go see him. So he says that he called us forward, and many of his ministers and the leaders of his different territories were there with him. And he called us forward and he called for a translator. And then he said that, أَيُّكُمْ أَقْرَبُ نَسَبًا بِهَذَا رَجُلَ الَّذِي يَزْعُمُ أَنَّهُ نَبِيٌّ Who amongst you is the closest in relation to this man who claims to be a prophet? And Abu Sufyan said that, أَنَا أَقْرَبُهُ نَسَبًا That I am probably the close, most closest related to him. So he said, then come forward. And he says that, he, came, he called me forward, I came forward, and he made me sit down in front of him. And he instructed my companions, all the people that were there with me, my trade caravan, to come forward and sit down behind me, facing him as well. And then he said that, إِنِّي سَائِلٌ هَذَا عَنْ هَذَا الرَّجُلُ فَإِنْ كَذَبَنِي فَكَذِّبُهُ I'm going to question now. I'm going to question this man from amongst you. He said to my travel companions, my business partners, I'm going to question him about Muhammad wasallam. If he lies to me, you tell me that he's lying. You call him out on it. And Abu Sufyan, he says that, I knew that if, if I did not know for the fact that they would call me out on my lies, I probably would have tried to lie at that moment. In another narration, he even says that, I felt like maybe they might not call me out in front of him, because at the end of the day, they, were, they would be more loyal to me than this king of Rome. But I knew for a fact that when we got back to Mecca, then they would tell everybody there that I was not a trustworthy person, I didn't have any dignity, I had no honor. That they would eventually call me out in my own community for lacking honor. Because he said that even in the time of Jahiliyyah, there was still some weird sense of honor. So for that very reason, one of the two reasons, or maybe both the reasons, he said that I knew that I cannot get away with lying uh, in this situation. So he said the first question that he asked me was, كَيْفَ نَسَبُهُ فِيكُمْ That what is this, his family status amongst you? 
So he says, وَفِينَا فِي نَسَبْ He is definitely a person who comes from a very respectable family. He says, the second question he asked me is, has anyone amongst you, amongst your people, amongst your tribe, ever claimed what he claims? And I said, no, nobody else has claimed that. Third question, he said that, were any of his forefathers kings that were dethroned? Were any of his forefathers kings who were dethroned? Now yes, the, the grandfather of the Prophet was a leader of the tribe, but that was still a tribal structure where there was still a council in a tribe. But what he's more so asking was any of his forefathers like dictators, leaders, tyrants, who were dethroned. And he says, no, that is not the case. He said, the next question is, فَأَشْرَافُ النَّاسِ إِتَّبَعُهُ أَمْ دُعَفَاؤُهُمْ Do respectable people, leaders, the elite, do the elite follow him? Or do more of the downtrodden and the overlooked, the disenfranchised amongst the society follow him? He said, I said more of the struggling in the community, those are the people that follow him. So he said, do they increase in number or do they decrease in number over time? He said, admittedly, they continue to increase in number. He says, next question, فَهَلْ يَرْتَدُّ أَحَدٌ مِنْهُمْ سَخَةً لِدِينِهِ بَعْدَ أَنْ يَدْخُلَ فِيهِ Does anyone turn away from him, turn on him, defect away from him, reject him, Particularly because of the religion itself after having entered into it? I said, no, we have yet to see that. So he says that, have you known him? فَهَلْ كُنْتُمْ تَتَّهِمُونَهُ بِالْكَذِبِ قَبْلَ أَنْ يَقُولَ مَا قَالْ Obviously now you don't believe what he says. But before this claim of his to be a prophet, did you know him to be a liar? Was he somebody who was just not very trustworthy? He said, no, that's not the case. He said, فَهَلْ يَغْدِرْ Is he, does he engage in deception? Is he not trustworthy? And he says, no, he is trustworthy. He says, but, وَنَحْنُ فِي مُدَّةٍ That same line. وَنَحْنُ فِي مُدَّةٍ لَا نَدْرِي مَا هُوَ فَاعِلٌ فِيهَا However, we are currently in a treaty with him. Now we don't know if he's gonna stab us in the back in this treaty or not. Abu Sufyan said, I had to kind of get my little jab in somehow. I had to get something in. Because this was not going very well. This dialogue was not going very well for me. So I had to kind of put something in, but it was speculative, obviously. It was theoretical, and we know that it was not true. Because the Prophet ﷺ would not betray them. We haven't gotten to there yet, we'll get there very, very soon. But in fact, the Quraysh would betray the, the Muslims in the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Nevertheless, he says that, is there, uh, he says, وَلَمْ تُمَكِّنَّنِي وَلَمْ تُمَكِّنَّي uh, كَلِمَةٌ أُدْخِلُ فِيهَا شَيْءًا غَيْرُ هَذِي الْكَلِمَةِ He says, that was the only jab I was able to take at the Prophet ﷺ in this dialogue. Then he says, فَهَلْ قَاتَلْتُمُهُ Have y'all had any confrontations, any battles with him? He says, yes we have. He says, فَكَيْفَ كَانَ قِتَالُكُمْ إِيَّاهُ How have you fared in these battles? He says, الْحَرْبُ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَهُ سِجَال It's been back and forth. Badr, they thoroughly defeated us. Uhud, we probably walked away inflicting greater wounds on them. Khandaq, while it was kind of a loss for us because we didn't achieve our goal, but it's not like anyone particularly defeated anyone. So he says it's kind of been back and forth between us. Yanalu minna wa nanalu minhu. Sometimes he gets the better of us, sometimes we get the better of him. So he says, Mada ya'murukum? What does he want from you? What is his platform? What is he preaching? What is he saying? He says that, أُعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَحْدَهُ وَلَا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا وَاتْرُكُوا مَا يَقُولُ أَبَاؤُكُمْ He says, worship one God alone and do not associate any partners with Him. Leave that what your forefathers used to say. وَيَأْمُرُنَا بِالصَّلَاةِ وَالصِّدْقِ وَالْعَفَافِ وَالصِّلَةِ He tells us to pray, He tells us to be truthful, He tells us to be dignified and respectable, chaste. And he tells us to be good to our families. Right? It's a beautiful presentation. Right? So then he says to the translator, the king says to the translator, now say to him. Now the king says, I will now speak. And you translate as I speak. سَأَلْتُكَ عَنْ نَسَبِهِ I asked you about his family situation. And you said that he comes from a very good family. That has been the case consistently for the prophets throughout time. They come from good, respectable families. They come from good, respectable, dignified families. 
And the Prophet ﷺ talks about this in a narration of Muslim al-Ahmad, that none of the Prophets, none of the Prophets were ever born out of adultery. They were was born out of marriage. Right? min nikahin, la min safahin. Right? So they were always born out of marriage. So they came from respectable families. I asked you, has anyone amongst your people ever preached this before, called to being a prophet before? And you said no. And he says that if somebody else would have made this claim not too long ago, then I could have maybe said, رَجُلٌ يَتَأَسَّى بِقَوْلٍ قِيلَ قَبْلَهُ He's a copycat. He's a copycat. I could have said that. But you told me nobody else amongst your people have ever claimed to be a prophet. He says, I asked you if any of his forefathers were kings and tyrants who were dethroned. And you said no. If you, if the fact was that one of his forefathers were maybe some kings or rulers, <clears throat> I could have said that this is a man who's trying to reclaim the throne of his forefathers. But that doesn't seem to be the case. I asked you if you knew him to lie before he preached this message. I know you don't agree with him now. But before this, had he pulled any type of schemes before? And you said no. So, he says, فَقَدْ أَعْرِفُ أَنَّهُ لَمْ يَكُنْ لِيَذَرَ الْكَذِبَ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَيَكْذِبَ عَلَى اللَّهِ It's hard to imagine somebody who does not have it within himself to lie to a human being that that person would ever possess the audaciousness, the audacity to lie about God. Somebody who would not lie to a person it's very hard to imagine that person one day decide, wake up and decide to fabricate and to have the audacity to lie about God himself. Then he said, I asked you if the elite follow him or do the people, the people, the real people on the ground, do they follow him? And you said that the lowly follow him. And he says that, وَهُمْ أَتْبَاعُ الرُّسُلِ He says that, those are the types of people that always follow the prophets and the messengers. I asked you if his followers day by day increase or decrease. And you said that they increase. And he says that is the nature of faith and iman. It's unstoppable. It's the truth. It shall you know, be, be realized. That's the nature of truth. It's a light and it spreads. Right? We even see this in our times. Just a little sidebar, a little side note to interrupt. We see that in our times, don't we? It doesn't matter, right? That there might be some crazy people in the fringes of our community who do all types of bizarre things. And then there are people on the opposite end of the extreme, but just as unbalanced, who vilify Muslims and Islam and campaign against and all the media is turned against Muslims, and everywhere you look there's negative publicity and media about Muslims. Yet, every day, every other day, somebody walks through those doors accepting Islam. That's the nature of Iman, that's the nature of faith. He says that, I asked you if any of his people abandon him, defect on him. You said no. And he says that, كَذَلِكَ الْإِيمَانَ حِينَ تُخَالِتُ بَشَاجَتُهُ الْقُلُوبَ that is the nature of faith in iman. When it mixes in with the heart. Al-imanu ma waqara fil qalb. Asluha thabit. It takes root in the heart and it never lets go. Alright? He says, I asked you if he, you've known him to be deceitful. And you said no. And he said, that is the nature of messengers. Kadalika rusul la taqdir. He says, I asked you what he calls you to, and you said that he calls to the worship of one God alone, no, and to not associate partners with him. He forbids you from worshiping idols. He tells you to pray and be truthful and be chaste, be dignified. If what you say is true, فَإِن كَانَ مَا تَقُولُ حَقًّا If what you say is actually true, فَسَيَمْلِكْ مَوْضِعَا قَدَمَيْ يَحَاتَيْنَ He will one day rule this land that is under my feet. And he was in the Bilad al-Sham. He was in that region, in that area. And he says that, قَدْ كُنْتُ أَعْلَمُ أَنَّهُ خارج. I knew that the Prophet of the last times was to come. Because it said about this particular king, that he himself was a student of scripture. He was a student of scripture. He had studied scripture. 
And so he says, I knew that there were prophecies that speak about a prophet coming, and I did not, I did not realize, I did not think, I could not imagine أَنَّهُ minkum That he would be from amongst you people. He'd be from amongst you people. In some other narrations, and we'll also see, it's going to mention something, but in some other narrations, he actually says that these, these wild, you know, uncivilized people, because the Romans looked down on a lot of the Arabs of that time. Right? So he says that I didn't think it would be from amongst you people. And he says that if I knew, I would go to him. And I would, you know, I would rush to meet him. And if I could find him, I would wash his feet. لَغَسَلْتُ عَنْ قَدَمَيْهِ Which is an expression that basically means, I would honor him. I would serve him. I would wash his feet. I would carry his shoes like we, you know, some, some of these types of expressions. That's what it means. I would sit at his feet. So then he, the narration now says that the reason why this, he had looked for Abu Sufyan and this entire conversation ensued was because he had received a message. The message had come from the governor of Busra which was an area of Sham. This is not the Basra in Iraq, this is Busra in Bilad Sham. So he had received a message from the governor of Busra, one of his governors, that a messenger had come to him with a letter from a man who claims to be a prophet. And he had sent, send this man in, with his letter to me. And that's what had led him to all this curiosity and this conversation ensued. So then he says, he called, he said, bring the messenger to me and tell him to bring his letter. ثُمَّ دَعَى بِكِسَابِ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ الَّذِي يُبَعَثَ بِهِ مَعَ دِحْيَا إِلَىٰ عَظِيمِ بُسْرَىٰ فَدَفَعَوا إِلَىٰ هِرَقَلْ So he comes and he gives a letter to the king. فَإِذَا فِيهِ So what the letter said was, بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ مِن مُحَمَّدٍ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ إِلَىٰ هِرَقَلْ عَظِيمِ الرُّومِ That this is a letter from Muhammad, the slave and the messenger of God, to the king of Rome. سَلَامٌ عَلَىٰ مَنْ اتَّبَعَ الْهُدَىٰ May peace be upon whosoever follows the guidance from God. أَمَّا بَعْدُ As for what follows, فَإِنِّي أَدْعُوكَ بِدِعَايَةِ الْإِسْلَامِ I call you to the message of Islam, submission to God. أَسْلِمْ تَسْلَمْ Submit to God and you shall find peace. يُؤْتِكَ اللَّهُ أَجْرَكَ مَرَّتَيْنِ God shall reward you twofold. And this is clarified in another narration of the Prophet ﷺ. The reason why he said that was, that was a virtue, that was a bashara, that was a reward, that was promised to the Ahlul Kitab. The Ahlul Kitab. The Christians and the Jews who would accept Islam. That they would get, that this was how they were encouraged, and how Iman was incentivized to them, that you'll get double the reward. Because of your previous, because of your love and your faith in the prophets of the past, and then you accepting Islam, and accepting the Prophet ﷺ as a messenger. فَإِن تَوَلَّيْتَ فَإِنَا عَلَيْكَ إِثْمَ الْأَرِيسِيِّينَ But he says that if you turn back on this, then upon you shall be the sin of the people. And Arisiyin basically refers to um, the common folk, the common people. Because he's a king, so he's saying the sin of your subjects who will reject the faith, because you rejected the faith. They'll follow your lead. Or maybe it will occur to them, but they will be intimidated by the fact that you have rejected the faith. So they will reject it out of intimidation of you. Or maybe they'll be emboldened by you, to oppose the religion of Allah, that sin, you will also have a share in that sin. Because you're a leader. With these privileges, with these benefits, with these luxuries, with this power, comes responsibility and accountability, and culpability and liability. Right? So, and then he put, the Prophet ﷺ had also dictated the ayat of the Qur'an, the verse from Surah Ali Imran, the ayah of Surah Ali Imran, ayah number 64, Ya Ahl al-Kitabi ta'alaw, O people of the book, come, ila kalimatin sawa'in baynana wa baynakum, to a message that we both share and understand and agree upon. Baynana wa baynakum, Allah na'abuda illa Allah, that we worship no one other than Allah, wala nushrika bihi shay'an, and we do not associate anything as partner with Him. 
ولا يتخذ بعضنا بعض بعضا اربابا من دون الله and let none of us take anyone else as partners aside from god fa in tawallaw but if you turn back on this if you turn your back on this fa qulu ishhadu bi anna muslimun that if they turn if they do not accept this message and say that we testify that we are muslim we will stick to our faith you are invited but if you turn your back on this we say that we are muslim we stick to our message and our faith so abu sufyan says falamma qala ma qal after he had said what he had said wa fariha min qira'atil kitabi and he was finished reading this letter kathara indahu sakhabu wa irtafa'at al aswat his ministers and his governors and the council started getting really rowdy people started screaming and shouting and yelling and arguing and debating because the tone of the king sounded very much like he was starting to incline towards his message and people started freaking out what's going on and we saw this happen with an anjashi before so he says fa ukhrijna they kicked us out they said go go shoo get out from here and i said when i when we got out i said to the rest of the people that were with me from quraish the trade caravan from makkah i said to them laqad amira amru ibn abi kabsha he says look at this he says because the arabs a lot of times would be referred to by the romans as like ibn abi kabsha which basically meant the son of the father of sheep they were considered like sons of shepherds lowly people villager bedouins nomads wandering about in the desert so he kind of says sarcastically he says look at how high the sons of shepherd have risen innahu yakhafuhu malik banil asfar the king of the romans fears arabs now they fear these desert wanderers these nomads these bedouins how funny right and he says fama zintu muqinan annahu sayadhhar hatta adkhala Allah alayya al-islam and he says from that point on forward i knew that eventually the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is going to come out on top i knew that he was going to win this situation out between us until allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me guidance to islam and i embraced and i entered the faith now the narrations basically go on to talk about the fact that Hiraqal at that particular time he the narration of Bukhari continues that he woke up one morning and a lot of what kind of led to this as well was he woke up one morning and he just did not seem well he's very disturbed khabith an-nafs it says asbaha yawman khabith an-nafs like he just did not feel well he seemed extremely disturbed so he said so some folks some of his people around him his close circle is in a circle they said qad istamkarna hay'atak we don't like to see you like this you seem like you are perturbed by something so hiraqal basically said that he says that hiraqal was somebody who was very much into astrology and the reading of the stars and all this kind of stuff so he says that i saw you know i was reading the stars and what i basically saw was that the king of the arabs shall soon rise the king of the arabs shall soon rise and the the interesting thing is that the way that he basically refers to it is he refers to the khatna circumcision because the romans did not practice circumcision but the arabs did even pre pre islamically so he basically then says that who amongst the people that we rule practices this so they said that laysa yahtatinu illa al-yahud it's just the the jews fala yuhimun fala yuhimannaka sha'nuhum you don't need to worry about them because we conquered them much before And he said furthermore there are still some Jews that live in this particular region if you would like we can send a letter there and we can go in there and wreak some havoc upon them So while they were talking about this a man uh the 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 governor of Ghassan that were some of the northern arabian tribes that had basically become christian and gone into the fold of the roman empire 
He sent a delegation with a man that they had captured to the emperor of Rome. And he basically said that we are dealing with something to the south of us where there seems to be this religion and this leader and he's amassing you know, a huge number of people. People are flocking to him. And we were able to capture one of his people and we have sent him to you to basically inquire and find out about this. So when they bring him to the emperor of Rome, he basically says that this might be what I was afraid of. And he basically says that, you know, check and see if he's one of those folks. And when they check him and they come back and they say, yes, he's, you know, he's as you described. So at that time, Hiraqal, he basically says, هَذَا مُلْكُ هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ قَدْ ظَهَرُ He says, he comes from that people where that king that I have seen, the man that will rise, the leader that will rise, and will overtake. So then Hiraqal, he basically writes a letter to one of his governors, and he says that, I want you to inquire and get further information. It is around this time, he says, that the letter comes to the emperor of Rome from the Prophet wasallam. And after this entire conversation, Hiraqal, this emperor of Rome, he basically calls all of his governors, his leaders, his most trusted advisors, the people who help him run his empire, he calls him into a private area, a, a place to meet with them. He orders the doors to be locked and to be sealed. And then he says, يَا مَعْشَرَ الرُّومِ هَلْ لَكُمْ فِي الْفَلَاحِ وَالرُشْتِ Let me ask you, are, we, are you interested in victory? And in doing the right thing? Rushd, doing the right thing? وَأَنْ يَثْبَتَ لَكُمْ مُلْكُكُمْ And would you like to remain in the dignity and the honor and the, you know, the resources that you have today? He says, if that is the case, فَتُبَايِعُوا لِهَذَا النَّبِي Then this prophet that has come up amongst the Arabs that we are hearing about, you need to follow him. You need to align yourselves with him. فَحَاسُوا حَيْسَةً حُمْرِ الْوَحْشِي إِلَى الْأَبْوَابِ He said all the people there, they started running like wild animals, they started running towards the doors, trying to break out. And they found, فَوَجَدُوا أَقَدْ خُلِّقَتْ They found that the doors had been locked. When Hiraqal saw their reaction, he, وَأَيَّأَيْسَ مِنَ الْإِيمَانِ He realized at that moment that this is not possible. He had hoped that maybe if I can convince my core people, my inner circle, to embrace this faith with me, we can make some type of smooth transition. But in that moment he realized, I will not have the support of my own inner circle, let alone my people. So then he says, Rudduhum عَلَيَّ He said, everybody come back here. Inni إِنَّمَا قُلْتُ مَقَالَتِي آنِفًا أَخْتَبِرُوا بِهَا شِدَّتَكُمْ عَلَى دِينِكُمْ He said, I said what I said to test, to see how loyal you people are. If you just defect over to another king just like that, and he said, I see now, your solid people, to your religion, to your kingdom, to your king, to your faith. And then the narration basically goes on to say that they all bowed down in front of the king. And that was basically the last, you know, glimmer or ray of hope when it came to this emperor of Rome. And that's the narration of Bukhari. So that's one major story in these letters and these delegations being sent out by the Prophet ﷺ. The other notable story is when the, and this is also mentioned by Imam Bukhari, that when the Prophet ﷺ sent, and some of the other narrations identified the Sahabi that he sent, he sent Abdullah bin Hudhafa ibn Qais. He sent him with a letter, this was another companion, Abdullah bin Hudhafa, he sent him with a letter to the emperor of Persia. And the letter had said, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Min Muhammadin Rasulilahi, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ila Kisra Adhimi Faris. 
سلام على من اتبع الهدى وآمن بالله ورسوله وشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأن محمدا عبده ورسوله وأدعوك بدعاء الله فإني أنا رسول الله إلى الناس كافة لأنذر من كان حيا ويحق القول على الكافرين فإن تسلم تسلم وإن أبيت فإن إثم المجوس عليك this letter seemed to be a little bit more detailed again because the Persians were Zoroastrian. They were not monotheists. They were not followers of any of the heavenly scriptures. All right? Albeit even a distorted form like the Christians were. But still, the base foundation was there. As the Quran says, These were fundamentally folks who, had, uh, who were polytheists. All right? And there's a lot of different discussion as to exactly what they believed. That fundamentally speaking, the Majus were more um, adherence to theodicy, which is basically a separation of a god of good and a god of evil, a force of good and a force of evil. Nevertheless, it's a, it's a manifestation of shirk. And that had later you know, further developed into a belief of different minor godlings and things of that nature. So they were mushrik. So that's why the letter was a little bit more detailed. Where basically the Prophet ﷺ wrote, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. This is a letter from Muhammad, the Messenger of God, to the Emperor of Persia, and may peace be upon the one who follows the guidance from Allah and believes in Allah and His Messenger, and testifies that there is no one worthy of worship except from Allah alone, and He has no partners, and testifies that Muhammad is the slave and the Messenger of Allah. I call you to what God calls you to, and that is the fact that I am the Messenger of Allah sent to all of humanity, so that I may warn, I may wake up those who are still the, amongst the living. And the decision of God is final against those who disbelieve and reject the belief in Allah. If you submit, you shall find peace. And if you reject, then the sin of all your people will be upon you. So that was the letter. But the interesting thing that's mentioned is that the letter had first been received by the leader the governor, so the, the Persians at this time, they had made a lot of expansions as well. And so the area known as Bahrain, the Bahrain today, that was also known as Bahrain at that time. So that region was governed by the Persians at that time. So the letter was first, the messengers were first received, intercepted by the governor in there in Bahrain. And he then further sent it forward to the emperor of Persia, because there was a protocol as well, you can just kind of walk into the office of the emperor of Persia, be like, hello, I have a letter. Right, you had to kind of go through the proper channels. So that was the proper channels, you had to go to the governor of the nearest region, and then that would carry you on forward. So when it reached Kisra, the narrations mention, some narrations mention that he read the whole letter. Some narrations actually mention he didn't even read the whole letter. When he started reading and it said, Min Muhammad, when, it, when he read, Min Muhammad Rasulullah ila Kisra Azimi Faris, that from Muhammad the Messenger of Allah to Kisra, the Emperor of Persia, he became infuriated that who does this man think he is? He writes his name before my name. Who is this? Because he was, and as we're going to talk about, he was a very, very arrogant, tyrannical ruler. And we'll talk about this in just a moment. So he became so infuriated by this, that he mazzaqahu. He tore up the letter. He tore up the letter and threw it at the messenger, and he said, this is where I think of your letter. And the messenger, he came back, to the Prophet ﷺ and informed him of what the the reaction of the of the of the emperor, and when the Prophet ﷺ was informed of his reaction for the Rasulullah ﷺ, some narrations mentioned the Prophet ﷺ actually made du'a against him, saying, "Allahumma mazik mulkahu, O oh Allah, you destroy, you tear apart his kingdom." And in some narrations, it wasn't so much of a dua, but it was more like a statement of fact that the Prophet ﷺ said that because of his reaction, because of his behavior, تَمَزَّقَ مُلْكُهُ That his kingdom shall be torn to shreds. Nevertheless, the story doesn't completely end there, because at this particular time, there was another uh, one of his governors that was in the region of Yemen. Yemen was also ruled and governed by the Persians at this time. So the governor in Yemen was a man by the name of Badam. 
Badam. So what the emperor of Persia said, and he, he said some very disrespectful words that are related in some of the narrations. He says, يَكْتُبُ إِلَيْكَ بِهَذَا وَهُوَ عَبْدِي وَلَا عِيَاذُ بِاللَّهِ He says that he writes me a letter. And you know, that was kind of like, you know, only a king could write a letter to a king, meaning only a leader could write a letter to a leader, in that sense. He says, he thinks he can write me a letter? I have no equal. Nobody can write me a letter. And so he says that when in fact he is my slave, he should be bowing in front of me. So then he says that Kisra, the emperor of Persia, he wrote a letter to his governor, Badam, who was governing over Yemen. And he said that, I want you to send two men, two investigators, to go there to where this man who has the audacity to send me a message, telling me what to do, send two investigators there and find out what this situation is, what's going on. So, <clears throat> this governor Badam, he you know, sends out two individuals, and he writes a letter along with them, from, uh, basically writes a letter to the Prophet ﷺ. Which basically the letter says, يَأْمُرَهُ أَنْ يَنْصَرِفَ مَعَهُمَا إِلَى كِسْرَى The letter says that these two men have come from the governor of Yemen at the order, at the command of the king of Persia. And you are hereby commanded to accompany these two men to go and stand before the king of Persia. Present yourself in the court. You have been summoned by the king of Persia to the Prophet ﷺ. So... These two men, they arrive there, they basically first get to Ta'if. It's very interesting. They first get to Ta'if. Now keep in mind, Ta'if is not Muslim at this time. And Ta'if is very much also very kind of uh, uneasy. Because now the Makkans have a peace treaty with the Muslims and things of that nature. So the people of Ta'if are very uneasy about the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims as well. They first arrive in Ta'if and the people of Ta'if are like, whoa, what are these Persian dignitaries? investigators doing here? What's going on? And when they say that we're looking for that man from Quraysh and this and this and that, where do we find him? And they tell him, okay, you go to Medina. This is where you go. The people of Ta'if become very happy. وَاسْتَبْشَرَ أَهْلُ الطَّائِفِ وَفَرِحُوا وَقَالَ بَعْضُمْ لِبَعْضٍ أَبْشِرُوا فَقَدْ نَصِبَ لَهُ كِسْرَى مَلِكُ الْمُلُوكُ كُفِيتُمُ الرَّجُلِ They start celebrating. They're like, yay, congratulations, celebration time. Why? Now he, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa has agitated the king of Persia. He's the king of other kings. Now he'll take care of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa You don't have nothing to worry about. Anyways, they arrive uh, in uh, Medina and they basically are brought to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and they deliver the message. They say that Shahan Shah, which is like the Persian term for king, Malikul Muluk, the king of kings, Kisra, Qad Katiba ilal Malik Badam, he sent a letter to the governor, the king of Yemen, who serves the king of Persia, that he sent us to you, that we are to get you and to take you, and you will stand before the king of Persia. And if you reject this offer to go and stand before him, and bow in front of him. فَهُوَ مَنْ قَدْ عَلِمْتْ Then you know who the king of Persia is. He's serious business. So you think about this. فَهُوَ مُهْلِكُكَ وَمُهْلِكُ قَوْمِكَ وَمُخَرِّبُ بِلَادِكَ He will kill you, he will kill your people, he will destroy your land. So you think about this. So when they come to meet with the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ basically receives them, he tells them that... He says, look, you guys have just arrived. Why don't you go take some rest? We'll talk tomorrow. Let's talk tomorrow. Say okay. Then that night, Jibreel alayhi salam comes to the Prophet ﷺ and informs him, أَنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ صَلَّتَ عَلَىٰ كِسْرَىٰ إِبْنَهُ Shade away. That Allah, Allah destroyed Kisra at the hands of his own son, 
Shedaway. That was the name of the son of the emperor of Persia, the king of Persia. His own son killed him in his sleep, assassinated him. And so the Prophet ﷺ is given this news. So the next day the Prophet ﷺ calls them and he tells them that, by the way, your king of kings, who's going to destroy all of us and kill all of us and burn everything to the ground, is dead. His son killed him last night. So I'm not sure if you want to figure things out. <laughs> Sounds like you have some things to figure out. Right? Not to be morbid, laugh at like an assassination, but it's just the situation. So they kind of respond with this shock and dismay. Hal tadri ma taqul? Do you even know what you're talking about? Are you crazy? Right? So the Prophet ﷺ says that you should find out about this. So at that time, these two messengers, investigators, whatever you want to call them, dignitaries, they go back to Yemen, to the king Badam of Yemen. They go back to him, and they basically tell him that, you know, he says, what happened? He says, uh, something strange. We went to talk to him and he tells us that Kisra's dead. Son killed him. Crazy talk. So we didn't know what to do, so we came back. After he informs him of this, shortly thereafter, Badam, the king of Yemen, he receives a letter from Shadaway, from the son who murdered his father, to take the throne. He sends him a letter saying that my father is dead. I have killed him. And he actually says that I killed him for the sake of my people. فَقَدْ قَتَلْتُ كِسْرَى وَلَمْ أَقْتُلْهُ إِلَّا غَضِبًا لفارس. I killed him for the people. لِمَا كَانَ إِسْتَحَلَّ مِنْ قَتْلِ أَشْرَافِهِمْ وَنَحْرِهِمْ فِي ثُغُورِهِمْ Because as I said, the father was a tyrant, bloodthirsty. He would assassinate, kill, murder, pillage, his own people even. He's a very bloodthirsty, tyrannical ruler. So he revolted against his own father and he said that I killed my father for the sake of the people and I am the king now and I ask you فَخُدْ لِي أَطَاعَةَ مِمَّنْ قِبِلَكَ So I ask you to pledge allegiance to me. Bow before me as you had served my father and now serve me. Now this ruler of Yemen he calls those two messengers corroborates the stories. And at that time, the king of Badam, he says, إِنَّ هَذَا الرَّجُلُ لَرَسُولٌ This man that you went to go see, investigate, look into, he is a messenger of Allah. فَأَسْلَمَ وَأَسْلَمَتِ الْأَبْنَاءُ مِنْ فَارِسْ مَنْ كَانَ مِنْهُمْ بِالْيَمَنِ he accepted Islam. His sons who helped him rule the region of Yemen all accepted Islam. And that led to all of Yemen accepting Islam. And shortly thereafter, Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu would be sent by the Prophet ﷺ to the people of Yemen. So they all accepted Islam. Alright? And so that was basically um, the story uh, of how uh, the, the, what basically transpired with the king of Persia. And that's the second notable story about the letters the Prophet ﷺ had sent out. To conclude here, this particular session, what I wanted to mention, what I wanted to talk about here is just the other letters the Prophet ﷺ had sent out and who he had sent them to. A third story that has just a little bit of detail is the Prophet ﷺ sent Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a رضي الله تعالى عنه to مقوقس who was the king of part of Egypt Iskandaria part of Egypt he ruled over a part of Egypt and the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم sent Hatib with the letter to him when he received the letter قبل الكتاب he kissed the letter أكرم حاطبا he honored the messenger أحسن نزله he hosted him himself personally وصرحه إلى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم and he sent gifts back for the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم basically accepted the message 
He sent gifts back for the Prophet ﷺ. And amongst the gifts that he sent for the Prophet ﷺ, one of the things that he had sent was, he sent a, um, a slave woman, a jariya, who was by the name of Maria, Maria Qibtiya, who would be, what, who would basically be with the Prophet ﷺ, and she would give birth to the final child of the Prophet ﷺ, Ibrahim. She would become Ummu Ibrahim, radiallahu ta'ala anha. Alright, so that was one of the gifts that he had sent. And another gift that he had sent was he also sent a bagal, a mule, a donkey for the Prophet ﷺ, that the Prophet ﷺ would name Duldul. Duldul. Because the Prophet ﷺ would name his animals. Right? Very compassionate, very merciful. Right, so the Prophet ﷺ would name his animals. So this particular donkey, the Prophet ﷺ named him Duldul, and the Prophet ﷺ would use this donkey as transportation quite a bit, particularly towards the end of his time, uh, because it became more difficult to get up on a camel or a horse. So a donkey was easier to ride in older age. So he, that Duldul, that donkey the Prophet ﷺ used to ride, was sent to him by this particular king, Maqawqis. Similarly, Ibn Ishaq says, the Prophet ﷺ sent Salit bin Amr, another Sahabi, to uh, the ruler, the governor of Yamama. He sent Ala ibn al-Hadrami to the ruler of Bahrain. He sent Amr bin al-As, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and Ammar, another uh, sahabi, or Jafar. Uh, he said, no, excuse me. He sent Amr bin al-As, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, to the two rulers of Oman. Oman at that time had two rulers, Ja'far uh, ibn al-Jalandi and Ammar ibn al-Jalandi, two brothers who were both Azadi in their lineage. They were brothers who ruled over Oman together, and he sent Amr ibn al-As to them. And the last and the final thing that I'll mention here, a little fa'ida that Ibn Kathir rahimullah ta'ala shares here from Imam al-Shafi'i. Imam Shafi'i rahimullah ta'ala talks about this. Imam Bayhaqi relates this from Imam Shafi'i uh, rahimullah ta'ala and Imam Nawawi in his Sharh of Sahih Muslim also quotes Imam Shafi'i about this. That he says that when Kisra, the emperor of Persia received the letter from the Prophet wasallam, he tore it to shreds. And when the emperor of Rome received the letter from the Prophet wasallam. He was not disrespectful, actually you could say he even dealt with it quite respectfully. He read it, he thought about it, he pondered it, he reflected on it, dialogued on it. He didn't accept the message, but he was respectful. He was respectful. It was very important. And because of this, Imam Shafi'i and many other scholars like Imam Nawawi and others, they say that um, because of this, we see that the fate of the Emperor of Rome and the Emperor of Persia were very different. The emperor of Persia was stabbed in his sleep by his own son. And the emperor of Rome, yes, you know, his kingdom would diminish over time. But he was not torn to shreds. He was not obliterated overnight the way the emperor of Persia was. And that's the difference between respect and a lack of respect. The second thing that he also mentions is that when the Arab came to Asham in Iraq for business, and many of the people there, um, you know, started to accept Islam, that many of the people in that region, they expressed fear, because Iraq was governed by the Persians at that time, and Sham, the Levant, Syria, Palestine, that region was governed by the Romans at that time. Many people started to kind of fear that we fear um, repercussions of us becoming Muslim from the rulers, from the kings. And the Prophet wasallam. He basically commented, Imam Shafi'i mentions this, إِذَا هَلَكَ كِسْرَى فَلَا كِسْرَى بَعْدَهُ وَإِذَا هَلَكَ قَيْسَرْ فَلَا قَيْسَرْ بَعْدَهُ That the Prophet ﷺ said, when this, when this emperor of Persia dies, when he is gone, there will be no kisra after him. And when the emperor of Rome is gone, there will be no emperor after him. Now this is discussed historically speaking, because they were succeeded by other rulers. So how do we interpret that statement of the Prophet ﷺ? The Prophet ﷺ was talking about Iraq and Asham. And what that meant was, once Iraq and Asham will be freed from the clutches of the Roman and the Persian empires, they will never again be conquered by those empires. And that is held true till today. And that was a prophecy foretold by the Prophet ﷺ.
And with that, inshallah, we'll go ahead and end here and we'll conclude here. But this was the uh, chapter about the Prophet ﷺ sending the letters out to the different kings and rulers. And inshallah, we'll continue on forward in the next session. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to practice everything we've said and heard. Subhanallah bihamdihi, subhanakallah bihamdik, nashar wa la ilaha illa anta nasakfirku wa natubu ilayk.